Who would win, Spider-Man or Link? How about Captain America versus Batman or Gojo versus Giorno? Power scaling is a controversial and complex form of media analysis, but it's also one of my favorites. For some people, the only exposure to the hobby is dorks on Twitter commenting, don't care, Goku stomps, under any post about another character. But there's actually multiple large communities full of fun and thought-provoking conversation, and that is the side of it that I want to share with you today. This iceberg will cover everything you'll need to know about the mechanics and concepts behind power scaling, as well as some of the more common debates, memes, and even some controversies, getting more and more niche the deeper we descend. This is the Power Scaling Iceberg. Tier 1 these are simple concepts and ideas that are very easy to grasp. If you've ever seen anyone discuss who would win in a fight, you've probably seen these terms thrown around. Power scaling. Power scaling is the comparison of different characters' powers to discern which is likely to win in a hypothetical battle. The basis of all power scaling is transitive relation. I know that sounds big, it's not. If A is bigger than B, and B is bigger than C, then A is most likely bigger than C. It's that simple. As an example, we've seen that Naruto beats Pain in a fight, and Pain beat Kakashi. So even though they never fight at this point in the series, we can determine that Naruto is stronger than Kakashi. This also works with characters across different franchises. Instead of comparing who they've beaten in a fight, we compare their stats and what they've accomplished. Attack Potency one of the most important stats to consider when power scaling a character, attack potency is just how much damage a character can do. This might be from how they punch, kick, shoot a laser, cast a spell, whatever. The point is, how much damage can they do? A lot of the time this will be measured literally and scientifically. We see the Hulk punch through this wall made of concrete, and after we do some math, we know this punch is at least 100 newtons of force. Much of the time, power scalers develop shorthand for when they don't want to or can't calculate specifically how much force a character exerts. Something like, Kid Goku's Kamehameha blew up a car, so we know his attack potency is at least car level. This is less than Superboy, whose heat vision destroyed a building, so he's building level. Durability. Durability is simple. How much force can a character take before they pass out or die? Some characters have average human durability. A single bullet from a handgun could end them. But stronger characters often take much more powerful attacks and aren't hurt at all. Feats. A feat is a citable example of a character showing one of their stats. If All Might punched so hard he created a tornado, that is a strength feat and can be referenced in discussions about him as proof that his punches are at least that strong. Now sometimes people will discuss anti-feats, or instances where a character looks particularly weak or showcases a vulnerability. This isn't super common, but it does happen. Speed. This is one that seems simple, but is actually pretty complicated in some matchups. At its core, speed is calculated as distance traveled over time. 10 miles per hour, a meter per second, etc. Where this gets complex is when you compare how fast a character runs to how quickly they can react to an incoming punch, for example. Or if their flying speed is actually faster than their running speed, etc. One Punch Man One Punch Man is a webcomic, manga, and anime originally created by One, who also authored Mob Psycho 100. The main character is Saitama, a superhero who is comically far more powerful than every other hero and villain in his series. Saitama frequently appears in versus debates, and most people erroneously assume that he can win a fight against any character out of all of fiction because that's his gimmick. We'll get into why that's wrong a little later, but for now, all you need to know is that there's a sizable group of people who believe the One Punch Man is the strongest character in all of fiction. Range. Range is how far away a target can be and still feel the effect of an attack. A good example is the Punisher, who has a range feat of just over two miles, sniping someone with a very powerful gun. 
but instead of projectile attacks, range could also be about how wide a character could spread a force field, how far away someone can be and still have a telepathic connection, etc. Range is all about distance and how effective an ability is based on that distance. Stamina. This is how long a character can last before they become exhausted. A great example of this, most people understand that Goku is far stronger and faster than Naruto. But Goku's greatest battles typically last an hour or less, while Naruto has battled nonstop for over 24 hours, and still he's tossing out high-level attacks at the end. Naruto has more stamina. Intelligence. How smart a character is. But this actually has some important variants. Most people assume intelligence is about how good you are at math, but there are many forms of intelligence. Ingenuity, or the ability to come up with new ideas quickly and effectively, is a very valuable type of intelligence in battles. Someone like Spider-Man has this in spades. But this is entirely different from kinesthetic intelligence, or mastery of the body. Characters like Goku or Gojo can perform complex and difficult martial arts after just seeing them once. This is a very powerful form of intelligence that is completely separate from mathematical or logical reasoning. Goku wins. This refers to how, sort of like there are those who think Saitama is the strongest character ever, there are a lot of people who think Goku is the strongest character ever, and love to make sure everybody knows it. They are wrong, of course, and usually they're just doing a little harmless trolling, which is all in good fun, but unfortunately, these are the people who tend to make others disillusioned with power scaling and view the whole hobby as a brainless shouting match. Tier 2 This tier has some of the ideas and vernacular of those who have already engaged in a few debates. BFR BFR, or Battlefield Removal, is a potential win condition in some debates. Consider, Superman is fighting the Hulk, and instead of punching him really hard or using his heat vision, Superman throws the Hulk into space. Now, Hulk may be able to survive in space, but he has no way of actually making it back to Earth to finish the fight. Even though he doesn't die, Hulk still loses this fight because he was removed from the battlefield. He was BFR'd. Environmental Destruction This is a character's non-battle attack potency. Essentially, when a character is so strong that they damage the world around them without intentionally attacking it. Maybe a character is constantly on fire, like the Human Torch, and just by standing still, he burns the grass that he stands on. How much damage he does passively to the environment can be used to add credence to calculated attack potency, or even describe why, for instance, Captain Cold's freeze gun wouldn't affect him. Cannon. Canon is the concept of continuity, or rather, the idea that specific versions of characters exist with unique histories, abilities, and feats. Once you understand the idea of canon, you can grasp that there are many different versions of a single character. There's pre-crisis Superman, post-crisis Superman, New 52 Superman, Rebirth Superman, Reeves Superman, Cavill Superman, DCAU Superman, and many others. Only then can you grasp how silly of a question Goku versus Superman really is. Well, which versions are we talking about? Are, are we doing some sort of amalgamation? How do you balance that sort of amalgamation? And this is why people end up arguing in circles. So many debaters can't wrap their mind around the fact that there are different iterations of a single character. Which leads us to Goku versus Superman. This is a debate that ravaged the internet for literal decades. The allure is obvious. Superman is notorious for always being strong enough to defeat any villain he faces, and Goku is the guy who always finds a way to get stronger and come out on top. They're both aliens sent to Earth by their parents and end up becoming her greatest protector. So of course people want to know which one can punch harder. The whole thing only got bigger when Screw Attack's death battle made two videos about the fight, with Superman coming out on top both times. This was highly controversial both times, but we'll talk about death battle in a little bit. Bloodlust. This is a term used to describe a status that can be applied to characters in a matchup. A bloodlusted character does not act how they normally would. 
Instead, their personality is erased, and they use their entire arsenal immediately with the intent to kill their opponent. This condition is usually used in battles with opponents who typically hold back considerably, or those who are too good-natured to try to kill someone. Think Spider-Man, Sonic the Hedgehog, or Deku. No-Cell. To no-cell an attack, it's sometimes called tanking, is when a character's durability is high enough to take an attack directly and suffer absolutely no damage. Batman's strongest punch would do nothing to Thor, so Thor could no-cell Batman's punches. Speed Blitz. This is when a character uses their significantly higher speed to take out an opponent before they even have a chance to react. Someone like The Flash or Quicksilver could speed blitz a character like Daredevil, so arguing the fight any further would be redundant. Hacks. Hacks is a term that comes from H-A-C-K-S, hacks, like you're playing an online game against someone and they're obviously hacking, making the fight unfair. Hacks abilities are those that tend to ignore strength, speed, durability, anything like that. For example, Spider-Man could obviously beat up Doctor Strange in a fist fight, but not if Doctor Strange uses his magic hacks to send Spider-Man to a different dimension, or turn him into Play-Doh, or revert him back into a baby. Those are hacks abilities. Now, some of these hacks have specific weaknesses, although that tends to happen more often in anime and manga. Power levels. Power levels are a concept introduced in Dragon Ball Z. It's over 9,000! <laughs> where a character's strength, speed, and durability could all be neatly represented in a single number. It's where the over 9,000 meme came from, measuring a power level, even though that was actually a translation error and it was 8,000, but whatever. What most people don't get is that power levels were deliberately introduced to show that with martial artists, who wins in a fight comes down to more than just raw power. And after the Frieza saga, these were phased out of the series. But that didn't stop fans from speculation of what Cell's power level was, or Super Saiyan 3 Goku, and this rudimentary form of speculation gave way to what would become a lot of modern day power scaling. Alien X. Alien X is one of the many aliens that Ben Tennyson can transform into from the Ben 10 series. The important thing to note is that he was popularized by Kuro the Artist in a video called why Ben 10 can beat Goku, Superman, and pretty much anyone. In the video, Alien X was gassed up to be completely undefeatable. And I want to make note here that his powers are incredibly impressive. He was even able to survive the destruction of the universe and then recreate it. And so most people considered him basically equivalent to God. This isn't correct, and some of the terms we'll get into later will explain why. But the important thing here is that this cemented Alien X up there with Goku and Saitama as a popular character for people to tout as the strongest in fiction. Multipliers. A multiplier is a simple numerical value used to describe how much more powerful a character becomes, whether it's after a time skip or after a transformation. The most well-known multiplier is Super Saiyan, which boosts the strength, speed, durability, and attack potency of a character by 50 times. Simple multipliers make extrapolating hypothetical feats very easy. If we know that Thor can lift 100 tons, and his belt of strength gives him a 2 times multiplier on his strength, then we can calculate his max lift at 200 tons. Easy. Stomp. A stomp is when one character very, very easily defeats their opponent, because the matchup was unfair. Rock Lee versus the Silver Surfer would be an obvious stomp, as the Silver Surfer is so many magnitudes stronger, faster, and more versatile than Lee, so he stomps. Death Battle Death Battle is a long-running YouTube web series by ScrewAttack and Rooster Teeth, where the two hosts, Wiz and Boomstick, power scale two characters and then watch them compete in a versus battle, ultimately declaring a victor and explaining why they won. Death Battle is a lot of fun to watch and has some really impressive animation sometimes, but it's sort of notorious in more serious power scaling circles for how often they get things wrong. 
They frequently use amalgamations of characters, ignoring canon and confusing the parameters of the fight. They also have a habit of rigging it so the less popular character wins, even if they shouldn't, all to stir up controversy and boost their views in the algorithm with all the angry comments they get. And finally, sometimes they just post easy stomps that anyone with any knowledge of power scaling will know the outcome is gonna be exactly what they think it is before the video even plays. Unfair matchups like The Flash versus Quicksilver. Ultimately, Death Battle is fun, but wrong very frequently, even though some people treat it like gospel. It's not. Tier 3. Now we're getting to real community-centric lingo. If anyone throws around these terms, they either consume power scaling content regularly, or they do a little bit of it themselves. This doesn't mean they know what they're talking about, though, so make sure to remember that. Fallacies. A fallacy is a common belief or argument that is based in unsound or incorrect logic. There are a lot of fallacies that are frequently used in power scaling debates, but to give you an example, one of the most common is ad hominem. This is where you try to say someone is wrong and your evidence is an attack on the person, not the actual character that they're debating about. You could tell me that Batman could lift 10 tons, and instead of disproving that, I could just say that you're stupid and you don't shower enough, you, you stinky, you smell. These are insults, not arguments, and that makes them an ad hominem fallacy. We'll get into plenty more fallacies further down the iceberg. Character-induced stupidity. This is when a character self-imposes restrictions or limitations on their abilities because they aren't smart enough to use them correctly. A great example is Denji from Chainsaw Man. He can unlatch the chains on his saws and theoretically use them to swing around like Spider-Man, but he never gets the idea, so he doesn't do it. Dimensions. Dimensions, or dimensional tiering, is an important part of higher level power scaling debates. First, you need to know that there are three spatial dimensions, length, width, and height. This is true in the real world. In power scaling, any character with an ability to affect two or more dimensions is infinitely more powerful than a character that can only affect one dimension, and so on. So if a character could affect the fourth dimension with their raw strength or speed, it can be inferred that they have more than infinite three-dimensional strength or speed. It's important to note that this does not include hacks. Hacks are by design special abilities that bypass typical physical limitations. So affecting a higher dimension in that way does not mean you have an infinite stat in this dimension. Game mechanics. A lot of times in video games, the character will have wildly varying abilities depending on how the player chooses to play. Because I found a glitch that lets Link travel across Hyrule in 1.6 seconds, that doesn't mean canon Link can actually move at the speed of sound or however fast that would actually be. In the same way, sometimes video games have mechanics that let you do things that don't make sense in the world. Good example of this is inventory. If I wanted to scale Minecraft Steve, I probably wouldn't take into account the fact that you could completely fill up his inventory with gold ingots, and he would technically be carrying an entire planet's weight in metal around with him. These game mechanics are usually ignored when scaling characters. This one. Uh, this is a, a word that is British slang for a very specific form of self-massage. Yeah, that probably won't get age-restricted if I phrase it that way. Basically, in power scaling, this means to over-exaggerate a character's abilities, intentionally or not, to make them seem stronger than they actually are. Sometimes people will do this by using fallacies, and other times their math is just wrong. If done unintentionally, this can be really annoying. But it can be a ton of fun if you're just goofing around and seeing how strong you can make a character while using a bunch of logical fallacies. For a good example, check out this episode of my podcast where we debated Stiltman versus Big Wheel. I promise, it's pretty funny. Lowball. So this is the opposite of the previous one. To lowball a character or feat is to assume the weakest possible version. Let's say Superman punches a building apart. 
A lowball estimate would assume the building was only as big as we saw and that it was made of weak materials. But a highball would assume the building is taller than we actually saw and was made of very durable metal or something. The lowball is the safest and most reasonable argument when gauging something. Standard equipment. Do you know how canon describes different versions of characters? Well, individual versions of characters can also differ quite a bit depending on their equipment. I could say MCU Tony Stark, specifically in Iron Man 2, but in that movie he wears like three different armors. Standard equipment is a term that means the character only has at their disposal what they usually do in most stories. Standard equipment Batman will definitely have batarangs and a grapple gun, but probably will not have the bat shark repellent he keeps around specifically in his watercraft. Jobbing. When a character jobs, they lose a fight they should normally win. This tends to happen in order to make a new villain look stronger, but sometimes it's due to a character-induced stupidity. Uh, maybe it's just bad writing, that's also a possibility. Great example is Vegeta. He jobs in basically every fight he gets into, always finding some way to lose so Goku can show up and win. In versus debates, jobbing is taken into account to invalidate stupid anti-feats. Like that one time, Flash got knocked out by Catwoman. That was the Flash jobbing, and should be assumed he normally would not lose in a fight against Catwoman. Flying Brick a flying brick is a term used to describe Superman-type characters. Very strong, very fast, nearly indestructible, and very strong. Notable flying bricks include Superman, Thor, Goku, Omni-Man, Captain Marvel, The Sentry, etc. Scans A scan is an image of a comic or manga page, usually a specific panel used to demonstrate a point. Often, someone will ask for a scan of something that seems unreasonable. If you told me Spider-Man has said he could beat the Hulk in a fight, I would ask for a scan of that conversation for you to prove it. Buster. So this one has two meanings, but they're towards the same point. Iron Man is known for crafting countless different armors, some of which are specifically designed to defeat a single opponent. The Hulk Buster is the most obvious example, but he has built a Thor Buster as well. More generally, the term Buster means the ability to defeat or destroy. Characters will often be called City Busters or Planet Busters. This is shorthand. This means that they have the attack potency to destroy a city or a planet. I don't need to debate if Frieza could beat Might Guy. Frieza is a known Planet Buster, and Guy isn't. You can get into all the details, but that shorthand makes it really simple. Suppression. A character will suppress their full potential and fight in a weaker state most of the time, and this is known as suppression. There are a lot of reasons for this. In Dragon Ball, the Saiyans enjoy battle, and so they purposely start off fully suppressed and work their way up to max power. Sometimes suppression is character-induced stupidity, but other times it makes sense. Maybe going all out drains the character's life away or makes them weaker over time. Batman with prep. This one is a meme. Essentially, because Batman has so many contingency plans for all these different scenarios, there are a lot of people that think with enough prep time he could defeat literally anyone. A lot of this stems from the fact that he did manage to craft a bullet capable of killing Darkseid, which is a crazy feat, but that doesn't make him unstoppable. Also, this one is kind of silly because there's no way to calculate the effectiveness of prep time. Like, I don't know, would he lose to Thor with a minute of prep time? But two minutes, oh, he would win. He's going to beat the God of Thunder easy. Solos. Okay, this one is my biggest pet peeve. To solo in a fight means a single character defeats many opponents by himself. That is what solo means. One alone. So if I put up a picture of 10 shonen characters and ask who wins, and you said Goku solos, that means Goku could beat everyone there, all at once, by himself. That is the right way to use the word. The wrong way 
is just interchangeable with winning. Like, Omni-Man versus Homelander? Oh, Omni-Man solos. No, 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 he doesn't solo. It's a one-on-one -on -one fight. What would soloing a one-on-one -on -one fight even mean? It's ridiculous. People just use words without any clue what they mean. Please, if you take anything from this video, just know that soloing is when one character beats many characters. It's not just synonymous with winning. Lifting strength versus striking strength. This one is simple, but a lot of people get it mixed up. Tell me who's stronger, Mike Tyson or Arnold Schwarzenegger? The correct answer is both. Arnold could lift more weight, but Tyson can punch a lot harder. The two are not mutually exclusive. So when people discuss strength, it's important to know that lifting strength and striking strength are related, but they're not interchangeable. In the same way, who's faster, Bruce Lee or Usain Bolt? Obviously, Lee can fight faster, but Bolt can run faster. Fighting speed and travel speed are different stats too, and should be measured separately. If you want to measure fighting speed, well that leads us into our next one. Reactions and perceptions. Essentially, this is how quickly a character can see something coming and react to it, either by blocking it, dodging, countering, whatever. In the real world, reaction speeds are limited to three things. Number one, the speed of light. We cannot react to something before we see it. Number two are neurons. It takes time for our eyes to signal our brain that something is coming. And number three, actual reaction time. This is based on training and you can get better at it. A lot of boxers instinctually dodge punches, but most people would just get smacked in the face by a similar attack. In fictional worlds, all three of these limitations are malleable. Characters can often see things that move faster than light, even though they shouldn't be able to see anything at all. This is all part of the suspension of disbelief, but it's important to know when gauging reaction times. Goku's Universal Punch This refers to a clash between Goku and Beerus at the start of Dragon Ball Super. It's sort of infamous because before Super, Dragon Ball characters were usually scaled to solar system or galaxy level at the very high end. But after sharing a strike that threatened to destroy the entire universe, including the entire universe-sized realm of heaven as well, Dragon Ball scaling was thrown into an entirely different realm of power. A lot of people like to downplay it because they find the scale so impossibly large, and of course there are others that assume this meant Goku was all-powerful. They were all wrong, and it led to a lot of discussion. Respect Thread This is a collection of a character's feats, neatly compiled for easy reference, usually with links to a scan of each feat. The point of a respect thread is to make future debates easier, with a quick place to look for everything you might need to know about a character. For example, a thread titled Respect Hokage Naruto would outline all of Naruto's abilities as an adult, with scans for his strength, speed, attack potency, hacks, etc. Tier 4 Slightly more niche and slightly more complex, this is where petty arguments begin to turn into long essays in the YouTube and Reddit comments. But if you like that sort of thing, let's go. Hyperbole. Hyperbole is essentially outrageous exaggeration. In the context of power scaling, this refers to character statements and guidebook descriptions that tend to really exaggerate things in order to get the viewer all hyped up. Notable examples include Shonen Jump ads describing every single new Dragon Ball movie or game as the most powerful battle in history, or a certain Naruto guidebook that said Part 1 Kakashi was omnipotent with his Sharingan, which is clearly not true. And if you don't really know what omnipotent means, don't worry, that's in the next tier. Inconsistencies. This refers to a character or ability behaving differently at points in the story, even though it shouldn't. Maybe Daredevil is normally fast enough to dodge gunfire, but someone smacks him with a baseball bat, and it's never explained why. These sorts of things are common in long-running comics and shows, and need to be considered when discussing versus battles. Plot-induced stupidity So you know that character-induced stupidity is when a character doesn't act in the optimal way because they're kinda dumb? 
Well, plot-induced stupidity is when a character doesn't act in the optimal way, even though they should be smart enough to know better. This is basically just bad writing. Plot-induced stupidity, or PIS, is important to point out when discussing a character's intelligence, because maybe they're usually smarter than how they act in these weird one-off instances. FTL. FTL stands for faster than light, and is shorthand for describing how fast a character can go. I'll briefly go over the other categories. Subsonic means slower than the speed of sound, or about 760 miles per hour. Sonic is the speed of sound. Hypersonic is five times the speed of sound. From there, we have a really, really big gap. Then we get to relativistic, which means approaching the speed of light. Basically, anything a tenth the speed of light or more is considered relativistic. Then we have FTL, and finally MFTL, or much faster than the speed of light. There are actually even faster tiers we'll talk about later, but these cover 99% of characters that you'll see talked about. Area of effect. So you understand attack potency, right? How strong your attack is, how much it can destroy. Area of effect is a term that relates to potency. Superman might punch Doomsday with enough force to shatter the Earth, but then why doesn't the Earth actually shatter? It's because the area of effect is limited to Doomsday's face. All that force isn't being spread to the planet. This is why characters in a lot of anime, like Dragon Ball for example, don't shatter the galaxy every time they spar. Universe. A universe is an infinite 3D space bound by a single dimension of time. When characters are described as crossing a universe instantly, or destroying a universe, remember from our section on dimensions that this means they have an infinite 3D stat. Although, they might just barely be brushing into 4D. Because there are so many different ideas floating around in fiction, some universes are distinctly finite, not infinite. Or maybe they're bound to different realms, like heavens, hells, different planes, magical pockets. The thing that binds all these places together is that they exist on the same timeline. They make up one universe. Stepping outside of that, and we get into a multiverse, which I will discuss later. No powers. This one is a meme. It's a common occurrence for someone on Twitter to pit two characters against each other, but with the caveat that they don't have the powers they normally have. Usually though, we have no way of actually determining what this means. Would no powers Goku simply have no key control? Will he still be bulletproof and super strong? Cause that comes from Saiyan physiology. Or what about Daredevil? Would he fight like he could see, but he didn't have his radar sense? We have no earthly idea, which is why these fights are usually pretty silly and there isn't any sort of distinct answer. Magic system. A magic system is the specific functions and rules of a particular franchise. For example, Naruto has chakra, and the characters in the universe use chakra in all sorts of different ways. Chakra is distinctly different from bending, which is the magic system from Avatar The Last Airbender. And then some universes have multiple different power systems. One Piece has Devil Fruits, but they also have Hockey. Jojo has Hamon, and it also has Stands. Burden of Proof Fallacy This is a fallacy where someone makes a claim, let's say, Gone Freaks is faster than lightning. And when asked to prove it, they turn around and say, No, 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 you prove he's not faster than lightning. This is wrong. The person who makes a claim must be able to prove it, either with a scan, a statement, or a scale that shows Gon really is faster than lightning. Every Pokemon versus one trillion lions. This is the closest most people get to doing any power scaling, as it's a popular question on Twitter and for streamers to debate about. Usually they end up using a bunch of fallacies and just horrible math but it's all for jokes and shouldn't be taken too seriously. Uh, for anyone wondering, the Pokemon win and it isn't even a little close. Word of God. 
Word of God is a term used to describe an author's statement about a story that wasn't actually shown inside the story. If Hirohiko Araki said that Jotaro's Star Platinum could punch with the force of the Big Bang, but has clearly never shown him doing that anywhere in JoJo, that would be considered Word of God. On the flip side, Death of the Author is a common literary criticism that basically says the author's comments outside the work itself shouldn't be considered, and you should judge the story on its own merits. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter which camp you fall into as long as you agree on one before you engage in any debates. Reality Warping This is a subset of Hack's abilities that specifically involves altering the nature of reality to your will. You might have a weak reality warping ability, like you can change the color of something. Or maybe you have a very strong reality warping ability, like you can turn people into candy. Whatever it may be, these are basically considered magic hacks and tend to bypass durability unless otherwise proven not to. Sailor Moon Sailor Moon, popular magical girl anime icon from the 90s, is on this list because most people have no idea exactly how powerful she is. To put it briefly, she is much faster than the speed of light, capable of destroying dimensions, has hacks that can let her time travel, survive the destruction of a universe, and exist outside a fourth dimensional time space, and actually recreate the entire universe not long after. She's insanely powerful. Kirby. Much like Sailor Moon, Kirby is a cute and innocent character that's secretly extremely powerful for anyone willing to do a little scaling. Kirby has punched enemies across planets, cracked worlds with his 200 million megaton punches, escaped black holes, and survived small supernovas. And all of this is with the big asterisk. Kirby is a baby star child, meaning that his powers are roughly equivalent to how much weaker a baby human is to an adult. Theoretical adult Kirby would likely be a multiversal reality warper with fourth dimensional attack potency. Seth the Programmer This is going to be a long one. Uh, Seth is a very notorious member of the power scaling community, especially recently. He was well known across the internet for his toxic and edgy interactions with people, always trying to goad others into debates and just steamroll them. He would debate Dragon Ball, Naruto, comics. He'd also talk about politics, philosophy, the age of consent, anything as long as he felt he could win the argument and he was just about as sore a winner as you could get the thing is when he wasn't debating in discord he would actually make some pretty informative youtube videos and had a lot of great collaborations with other power scalers chuck swag kage six noodles uh king of lightning there's a ton of them he was super entertaining, but he loved to play up this villain persona where he would mock his fans, call them losers, virgins, flex how much money he makes, and just generally act like a huge jerk. He really only stopped getting away with it when Clyde, his former friend and collaborator, dropped a big video explaining why he stopped working with Seth. It detailed a lot of horrible things Seth had done, Manipulating people, lying, trash-talking, backstabbing, defrauding his Patreon supporters, basically anything he could do to lord his power over others, and this included some very sketchy interactions with minors. Seth since dropped a big explainer about how that was misconstrued and how he never did anything explicit, and though most of the internet abandoned him, a chunk of his followers are still around. Here's the thing. Seth really did his best to focus the entirety of this controversy on this brush with the minor, which he could, you know, mostly disprove rather easily. But in doing so, he shoved a lot of the other stuff under the rug where he wouldn't need to address it. But I will spell it all out here for you very simply. Seth the Programmer is extremely insecure. He craves the validation of his fans and the people who think they're his friends. And when he's feeling bad, he dumps on them to lift himself up. He didn't write or edit the vast majority of his best videos, and many of the really good scales he used were devised by other people, and he took all the credit. He's an egotist, but he's also a huge fraud, a liar, and a massive hypocrite. And if this seems like I'm being super harsh and mean, 
it's because I actually really used to like Seth a lot, back when I was an edgy teenager. Um, he's actually pretty sharp and really good at debate, um, but everything about him is toxic. And after getting a peek behind the curtain and learning how he begs his friends for validation while acting to the public like some machismo ubermensch, I really just kind of pity him now. Here's hoping he actually gets some help instead of pretending like nothing happened. Tier 5 Okay, we're getting into bigger ideas now. Sci-fi jargon and theoretical physics are pretty much the norm from here on out, so buckle up. Omnipotence Omnipotence is someone who is all-powerful. What's important to note is that this is in the most literal sense. An omnipotent character can do literally anything, in any dimension, in any place, in any way that they want. There is no limit to how much they can lift, how fast they can go, how hard they can hit. It is the maximum across the board. Can an omnipotent character create a stone so heavy that he couldn't lift it? Yes. Doesn't matter that that doesn't make sense, it doesn't need to. He's omnipotent. Of course, a lot of time, characters who are very powerful will be described as omnipotent, but they actually are not. Um, we'll get into a few of them later, but for now, just know that those are mostly hyperbole. Outliers. An outlier is a feat or an anti-feat for a character that doesn't make sense when their other feats are taken into consideration. For example, if Batman can usually lift 500 pounds, but in one single issue from 1972, he can lift 2,000 pounds, that is an outlier. Because there are so many more instances where he can lift 500, we consider the 2,000 pound feat to be an outlier and we ignore it. Now, some people will consider rarely presented abilities to be outliers, but that's different. A feat is only an outlier if it is regularly contradicted, not if it just doesn't get referenced all that often. Association fallacy. This is a fallacy where someone draws a false conclusion just because two characters are associated. For example, Deku from My Hero Academia was able to beat the villain Muscular, and because Ida is in Class 1A along with Deku, he could also beat Muscular. This is wrong. Gravitational binding energy. This is the amount of energy it would take to completely disperse a celestial body, or effectively overcome the force of gravity keeping it together. This means planets, moons, large asteroids, and stars. It's calculated with this equation, where U is the force we're looking for in joules, G is the gravitational constant, M is the mass of the planet, and R is its radius. The calculation for stars is only slightly different, as it also includes the value N, which is the polytropic value. Basically, it says what kind of star it is, white dwarf, red giant, etc. Uh, these are equations that tell us exactly how strong a feat is in a measurable number. Multiverse. A multiverse is a fifth dimensional time space that contains any multitude of four dimensional universes. Each individual universe in a multiverse has infinite time and space, so a character who can affect more than an entire universe with their attack potency has edged into multiversal destructive capability. Universal Energy System We talked about power systems earlier, essentially the way magic works inside a fictional universe. The universal energy system is one of three ways to classify magic systems. It basically means that if a character has a supernatural power, like shooting a laser or firing a spell, then their other stats would be roughly analogous. The energy system is universal. Goku's Kamehameha is in the same tier of power as one of his punches, as well as his level of durability. If a character blows up a star, you can assume they'd probably survive a star exploding too. The second type is a non-physical energy system. This is basically the opposite. So a character may have a fire spell or something that could blow up a building, but that is in no way evidence that they could survive a building that blows up. Their magical feats and their physical stats are not related. 
but their magical feats are assumed to be related. So if your fire spell is building level, your wind spell is probably also building level. And finally, we have a limited energy system. This is where you don't assume anything is related. Nothing is analogous. So a character may use magic sometimes and technology other times, and their feats with either are not assumed to be proportional, nor do they scale to physical stats. Every single thing is separate. Appeal to motive fallacy. This is a fallacy where you attack the person arguing instead of the argument, but instead of ad hominem, this one isn't an insult. Instead, you attack their motive. You only think Sasuke beats Naruto because you're an Uchiha fanboy. That's an appeal to motive fallacy, and it's not a legitimate argument. Weak Homelander. So this one was a meme on Twitter for a while, and it's pretty funny. In the Amazon series The Boys, the most powerful soup is Homelander, a flying brick and dark parody of Superman. The joke is that, while he's the strongest inside the boys' universe, he's actually quite weak when you scale him against other fictional verses. It's funniest when you know how much of a vile monster he is, and he loses handily to the most sweet and innocent characters like Kirby, Deku, or Tanjiro. Galactus Hunger In Marvel Comics, Galactus is a living force of nature that consumes worlds, eating planets to maintain the correct level of entropy across the universe. Because he absorbs the powers of these planets, his power actually varies depending on how long it's been since he last ate a planet. And so, in versus battles, people will often specify full Galactus, or starving Galactus, or mildly hungry Galactus. It's kind of funny, so there were some memes about Okay, could Thanos beat Galactus if he had, like, a late brunch, but no dinner yet, and it's already 7 p.m.? Funny stuff like that. Astral Resistance. This is the ability of a character to defend against attacks made not to the mind or body, but the soul or spirit. A character with strong Astral Resistance could tank the forced projection attack Doctor Strange does, uh, where he knocks your soul out of your body. They would get hit, and nothing would happen. Or, like in Dragon Ball, where Hakai attacks destroy the body and the soul, surviving one would prove you have a high level of astral durability. Attosecond. An attosecond is a very, 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 very short amount of time. It's used to calculate speed feats by characters like Sonic or The Flash, who are just ridiculously, nonsensically fast. In case you're wondering, an attosecond is equal to one quintillionth of a regular second. Put another way, the number of attoseconds in a normal second is the same as the number of normal seconds in about 30 billion years. And the Flash has stated that he's able to perceive and understand events that happen in less than an attosecond. Yeah, chew on that. Squirrel Girl. Squirrel Girl is a Marvel superhero, real name Doreen Green, who has the ability to control an army of squirrels. She's sort of infamous in power scaling because she tends to only show up in stories and one-shot the villain, just overwhelming them with a mountain of squirrels. They may not, that may not seem like a big deal uh, if she fought like Kingpin or Modok or something, but she's beat Thanos, Galactus, Doctor Doom, just with squirrels. The One Above All, and The Presence. The One Above All is the god of the Marvel Universe, and The Presence is the god of the DC Universe. Now, I don't mean a god like Thor or Zeus or Darkseid, I mean capital G, God. Omnipotent, all-powerful, unmatched. They exist above all other beings in every dimension in their respective canons, and are usually referenced whenever someone is talking about a truly omnipotent character. And if you're wondering what would happen if they fought each other, it's the exact same thing that would happen if they fought any other true omnipotent. Instantaneous and eternal stalemate. Kinda anticlimactic, huh? Stan Lee argument. This refers to a popular clip of Stan Lee, discussing a question he frequently got from fans. Which character would win in a fight? 
and his response is that the writer decides who wins, and that's that. Arguing about it is completely pointless. And so many people use this to describe power scaling as pointless or inherently stupid. But here's the thing. I don't think Stan Lee was right. Not exactly. See, he was a writer. It was his job to tell stories and make them entertaining. So if you asked him who would win between Spider-Man and Iron Man, his gut reaction isn't to start doing math, but instead to concoct a story where the two of them would have a reason to fight and then figure out a way to make that fight fun to read. Maybe Spider-Man is tweaking the Shocker's gauntlets after he got in the tough, and then he ends up using them to take down Tony. That's not cold, calculated versus battle. It's an exciting story. If you don't believe me, take a look at this. Stan Lee might not like ranking characters by power, but there are a ton of official Marvel panels that power scale the characters for us. Like this one here, which shows us seven popular heroes and tells us exactly what their maximum lifting strength is. Enough said. All right, that's the end of tier five. We're halfway through this iceberg. So I wanna take a really quick interlude to ask you to consider, give this video a like and maybe subscribe to my channel. I'm gonna keep it real with you. I talk about nerd shit all the time. Whether it's power scaling, making theories, rewriting bad stories, I've got content lined up through the end of the year for Marvel, DC, ton of anime and games, all great stuff. So maybe stick around. If you're feeling generous, give me some money on Patreon, please. Uh, you'll get access to my Discord server and you can ping me to ask who wins between SpongeBob and Peacemaker. All right, back to the iceberg. Tier 6 In this tier, we're talking about more than just two characters fighting, but instead larger groups and more nuanced competitions. Things are getting kind of complicated. Attack Name Fallacy This is a fallacy that asserts an attack does exactly what it's named. For example, Vegeta has the Big Bang Attack. It's pretty easy to tell that this actually doesn't have the force of the Big Bang behind it. Or Deku's 1 million percent smash. Word of God later clarified that the 1 million percent was simply hyperbole. Deku was using it to psych himself up. It wasn't actually 10,000 times stronger than his maximum. So if anyone wants to tell you that Cyborg is really firing a million decibels from his million decibel sound cannon, you can tell them that's the attack name fallacy. The Kardashev scale. This is a scale used to calculate a civilization's technological development. It's all centered around how efficiently they can capture and use energy. At the bottom are sub type one. These are civilizations unable to completely capture and store the energy of a planet. That would be us, humans in real life. We may be able to harness some geothermal and wind power, but not up to 100% efficiency. Then we have Type 1, who, as you might have guessed, can 100% efficiently use a planet's energy. Their mastery goes to the point where they can even control physical phenomena, like earthquakes and volcanoes. Type 2 sieves can directly consume and efficiently utilize the energy of an entire star. This makes them incredibly powerful, as stars are gigantic fusion engines. Finally, Type 3 civilizations are completely utilizing the power of an entire galaxy. This is a crazy amount of energy, and this is where Kardashev's types ended. But with all the different stories in fiction, more types were eventually introduced. Type 4 can use all the energy in a galactic supercluster, and Type 5 can use an entire universe. Type 6 can generate more than an entire universe of energy in a single second, continuously, forever. And Type 7 is so powerful that the amount of energy they manipulate is beyond calculation. Civilization Tiering System This is a different way to scale a civilization, as opposed to the Kardashev scale. While that measures how much energy a people can produce, the civilization tiering system instead keeps track of how advanced their government and technology is. Starting at the bottom, we have pre-industrial. They haven't yet discovered electricity, they're relying on simple tools and animals for transport and battle. After that, there's post-industrial, essentially what every nation on Earth is like today. 
Beyond that is planetary, a single civilization that controls an entire planet, all under one government. A stellar civilization controls a whole solar system. An interstellar civ controls multiple solar systems. From there it goes galactic, intergalactic, universal, multiversal, higher dimensional, and finally, transcendent. Omnipresence. Omnipotence is to be all-powerful, and omnipresence is a single element of that, to be all-present. Essentially, this is the peak of speed. You exist everywhere, in every single location, simultaneously. Now, it's important to note, just because you're omnipresent doesn't mean you're omnipotent. You may be everywhere at once, but you might still have weaknesses. You can't lose in a race, though. That's the one thing you have here. Omniscience. Omniscience is to know everything. All things that have happened, are happening, or will happen. You have access and full view of all of it. This includes what people are thinking. After all, thoughts are just electrons firing inside neurons, and you can see that happening. No limits fallacy. This is a fallacy that assumes because a limit has not been shown that no limit exists. For example, Superman has lifted 100 tons, a million tons, a billion tons, and he's never struggled. The no limits fallacy would state that he can lift literally infinite weight, since we've never known that he has a limit, we've never seen a limit. This is an assumption, and it's wrong. This is also sometimes called the world of ants. Essentially, if there's a character who gets in hundreds of fights, but only ever fights ants, and they always win just by stepping on them, the no limits fallacy would say they could beat any character ever because they've never lost inside their world of ants. This is also wrong. And by the way, this is why Saitama doesn't beat everyone in fiction. He may beat everyone in his own series, but that doesn't mean there aren't characters outside the series who couldn't beat him. Toon Force. This is the ability of a character to use very powerful reality warping for comedic effect. Characters like Bugs Bunny are a great example. He can teleport, shapeshift, lift infinite weight, alter the malleability of objects, transform his environment. His abilities are seemingly limitless, but only if they're for comedic effect. This is known as Toon Force, short for cartoon. Sometimes characters will have a limited amount of Toon Force. A Raleigh from Dr. Slump has crossed over with Dragon Ball Super, and while she's strong enough to beat godly fighters, but she has no business fighting, her comedic powers don't let her contend with Beerus, who is too serious and powerful for Toon Force to work on. G.E.R. G.E.R., or Gold Experience Requiem, is the stand ability of Giorno Giovanna from Jojo Part 5. G.E.R. is sort of infamous in power scaling, or at least it was for a while, for its wacky ability. Return to zero. It can return anything to zero, and if you're confused what that means, it's intentionally vague. That's what makes it powerful. You run up to punch Giorno, well he returns your position to zero, so you never moved. Uh, you manage to land a hit on him, he returns the damage to zero. He punches you to death, guess what, he can return your death to zero, so you live over and over again infinitely. And get this, Giorno doesn't even need to see the attack coming. G.E.R. can act without his knowledge. He even did so against Diavolo during his time skip, arguably scaling his awareness to high fourth or low fifth dimensional. Slap on a healthy layer of no limits fallacy and for a while, many posters thought G.E.R. was completely unbeatable. Power Levels, Current Year this is a reference to a very low effort form of YouTube video that gets a ton of views, despite how inaccurate they are. Basically, the person making the video picks two characters, let's say Naruto and Sasuke, and then they assign them power levels based on different points in the story, culminating with their current strongest forms and some ridiculously huge number to go along with it. These numbers are not based in anything substantial, they're just guesses but they do sate the curiosity of little kids who are just starting to get into versus debates. That's why they get so many views. As long as you don't actually take them seriously, they're harmless fun. Grand Master Luke. This refers to Luke Skywalker as he was depicted in the Star Wars Extended Universe, 
the now non-canon collection of books telling the story of the Star Wars characters after Episode VI. Luke became substantially more powerful in these stories, to the point where he could do with the Force what was barely recognizable from the movies. He could fold space to teleport himself and objects, he has nanosecond reaction times, can project his thoughts into thousands of minds across the galaxy simultaneously, and he even uses the Force to affect a black hole. In that canon, he's the most powerful Force user who ever lived and is frequently used to scale other Jedi and Sith against. Speed Force, lol. This is another meme, this time about the Flash. All versions of the Flash, be they Jay Garrick, Barry Allen, Wally West, all of them tap into a supernatural and extra-dimensional power known as the Speed Force. This force grants them their tremendous speed, but it also allows them a myriad of other powers, some of which make no sense. For example, the speed force will surround and protect anything the Flash is holding, so when he picks up a person and runs them across the country at a thousand miles an hour, they don't splatter apart from the G-forces. Or sometimes when he needs a costume, he can just summon one out of speed force energy. Whatever the hell that means. It's the Speed Force. I ain't gotta explain shit. Varying Fourth Dimensions This is an important one to understand when discussing characters who affect or control time. See, we are aware of three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension. The fourth dimension is time. This is generally the case in most fictional universes. But in some, this is not the case, and the fourth dimension is separate from time, meaning there are four spatial dimensions, and then time is the fifth dimension. Make sense? So a character in that universe could transcend three-dimensional speed, but instead of time being affected, they would simply begin moving fourth dimensionally. It's a bit difficult to wrap your head around, I know, but just remember, the fourth dimension isn't always time. Slow Thor Thor, Marvel's God of Thunder, is very powerful, and incredibly fast as well. He has very good traveling speed feats, as he normally flies through space. Unfortunately, he has significantly more battle speed and tie feats. What this really comes down to is plot-induced stupidity. The writer needs to find a way to keep the godly Avenger tied up so the rest of the team actually has some time to shine. This translates to Thor being smacked around by slow-moving attacks, hit by cars, shot with normal guns, etc. In reality, he has plenty of battle feats that show him with much greater reaction times, but because there are just so, so many scans of Thor jobbing to slow-moving objects, there's a pervasive belief that Thor is super strong, but very slow. Interverse Mechanics So, you understand magic systems. Naruto has chakra, Avatar has bending, but what about this? Let's say Aang tries to do spirit bending, an ability that takes away his opponent's ability to bend, and he uses it on Kakashi. Would spirit bending sever Kakashi's ability to use chakra? Would it stop a Jedi from using the Force? This question is how the mechanics of abilities work across universe are important and must be decided before a debate if you hope to get anywhere. Otherwise, even the weakest of characters from Hunter x Hunter could defeat Goku with a simple Ren projection. That's kind of silly. Ash's Pikachu. This is a reference to the Pikachu from the Pokemon anime and games. If you take the time to actually calculate every battle this Pikachu has been in, all the XP he should have earned from those fights, in conjunction with some of the crazy feats he displays in the movies, he becomes disgustingly powerful. For example, in the 18th movie, during a clash against the antagonist Hoopa, Pikachu's Thunderbolt is able to counteract the force of six of the most powerful legendaries in existence, including Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina. It's lumped in with some attacks from other legendaries, but through scaling, it's clear that they were holding off Hoopa. So Ash's Pikachu is literally on the level of the Pokemon gods of time, space, and antimatter. And if you don't believe me, I'll put the scale for this one in the description. STTGL In the Gainax anime Gurren Lagann, the main character, Simone the Digger, pilots a mecha along with his crew, Team Die Gurren. 
The mecha continuously evolves throughout the series, attaching onto and absorbing larger and larger enemy mechs. Towards the end of the show, Simone's spiral power, or humanity's indomitable spirit, push their mech to evolve to extremely high levels of power. Their pinnacle is Super Tengen Tapa Gurren Lagan, which is what STTGL stands for. This enormous construct dwarfs the entire universe and has 11th dimensional multiversal attack potency and durability, omnipresence, probability altering attacks, and this is all with the implication that it can continue evolving further forever. STTGL is usually used as a benchmark when discussing complex multiversal opponents, or as an easy dunk when someone says Goku's the strongest anime character ever. He's not. Dodging lasers. This refers to a character's feats where they dodge out of the way of a laser attack, and how that doesn't necessarily imply they have light speed movements or reaction times. For example, if you shot a laser gun at Batman and he dodged the blast, it's likely because he got out of the way while you were aiming and pulling the trigger, not after it already fired. This is important to understand, so characters aren't accidentally scaled up to outpacing photons. Tier 7 From here on out, we're getting a lot of deep cuts, strange arguments, confusing logical fallacies, and niche ideas that debaters will reference like top-level chess players bringing up famous strategies and gambits. Higher Dimensional Existence We've sort of covered the basics of this one already. We know a being with fourth dimensional strength has more than infinite three-dimensional strength. But oftentimes, they're typically bound to three dimensions and only express higher dimensional stats when participating in their outlandish battles. But a being that has higher dimensional existence is by their very nature unbound by our three dimensions. Physical distance and its implied limitations do not apply, and so they appear godly in turn. For example, Mr. Mix's Pitalik of DC Comics is a fifth dimensional imp. He can casually teleport, reality warp, and use all manner of hacks, because spending any time down in the third dimension is like entering Minecraft creative mode for him. Omniverse You know that a universe is an infinite 3D space bound by time, and a multiverse is a collection of universes bound across a fifth dimension. But what about a multiverse of multiverses? This is what's known as a hyperverse, and that name sticks for the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th dimensions. But if you're feeling really cheeky and you want multiple 11th dimensional hyperverses all collected beneath a 12th dimension, this is known as an omniverse. It's essentially incomprehensible for us to fathom, but there are fictional characters that have this level of power. Note. Omniverse is sometimes used interchangeably with Outerverse. If a character is called Outerversal, this means they are beyond 11th dimensional in attack potency, durability, speed, etc. Argument from Incredulity Fallacy This is a very common fallacy that people often struggle to argue against because they don't know how. When someone commits this fallacy, they claim something is wrong simply because they can't believe it. They refuse evidence simply because it seems outlandish to them. For example, someone making this fallacy might say, I don't care if you have a scan. I don't believe pre-crisis Superman destroyed a solar system with a sneeze. That's too stupid, so it didn't happen. He can't do that. Ultimately, this is a really childish argument, but that's what makes it so difficult to refute. Gag character. A gag character is one whose purpose in a story is for comedy primarily, usually with a heaping helping of tune force. The reason they're on this iceberg is many people believe gag characters inherently win versus battles by their very nature. Taking that a step further, they can then apply the term gag character onto a character who happens to be funny, and suddenly they now have an argument as to why they're invincible. Of course, we know by now that Toon Force often has limits, and powerful gag characters are still subject to the World of Ants argument, so if you run into this argument in the wild, 
Now you'll know. It's bogus. Krillin versus Marvel. This is in reference to Sonny Strait, the English voice actor for Krillin in Dragon Ball Z. He made a Twitter post in 2017 where he stated that Krillin, despite being relatively weak in his own series, could defeat every character in the Marvel Universe with ease and defeat all the Avengers at once. This led to a bit of a dog pile where hundreds of power scalers sent him arguments, scans, and quotes from guidebooks telling him just how wrong he was. And while he tried to argue a little bit, at the end of the day, he responded pretty charitably with a, wow, you guys sure know a lot, uh, maybe there are some pretty strong Marvel characters out there. I think he handled it well, but some people still reference it when discussing how little the general public actually knows or understands about the complexity of these things. But as long as you're nice about it, remember it's okay to be proven wrong sometimes. We're all having fun with this, you don't need to be vitriolic or snarky. SCP-682 Known as the hard-to-destroy reptile, this is one of the countless entries in the SCP Foundation Wiki, a collaborative fictional secret agency that captures and retains anomalous monsters and objects. 682 is a large lizard with the unique ability of adaptation. What this means is that it will instantaneously evolve in order to survive whatever situation it's put in. If you put it underwater, it grows gills. If you drop it in lava, it becomes heat resistant. Put him in space, hey, he no longer needs to breathe. What makes him so formidable is when you start to get creative. Well, if I threw Naruto at him, he'd likely find a way to nullify chakra. If I pit him up against Superman, he'd grow immensely stronger and gain the ability to fly. And if you had SCP-682 fight Super Tang and Tapa Gurren Lagann, He'd likely evolve into an outerversal being. See how quickly this becomes insane? Immeasurable speed. We discussed speed earlier, from subsonic all the way to massively faster than light. And if you understand infinite speed, too. But beyond that is immeasurable speed. When something is immeasurably fast, it not only can move infinitely fast, but it can travel through time. See, if speed is distance over time, the only way to go faster than infinite distance over finite time is infinite distance over negative time. Going so fast, you finish the race before you start it. Looking at it another way, say that there were a closed space where time does not exist. If you or I were there, we would be frozen, completely unable to think or move because time does not pass. But a being with immeasurable speed is able to move even in a realm without time. It is only a single step down from true omnipresence. Zeno, the Omni King. Introduced in Dragon Ball Super, Zeno is the little guy who sits atop the hierarchy of gods. Because Dragon Ball is the series that got so many people into power scaling to begin with, there's a very large consensus who believes Zeno is omnipotent. This is not true. Zeno may be the most powerful being in Dragon Ball, but we know that at the very least he's bound by the fifth dimension, as multiple versions of him exist across different timelines. Zeno is not all powerful, he is not on the level of the one above all or the presence. Mario and Luigi versus Sephiroth. This one is a bit of a meme, but it's pretty funny. It started as a Twitter thread pitting various video game characters against one another. But the reason it got so popular is because of the outcome. Mario and Luigi take this fight easily, and it's not even close. Obviously Sephiroth is an extremely powerful character, he's the final boss of Final Fantasy VII, but Mario and Luigi, specifically from their titular RPG series like Dream Team or Bowser's Inside Story, have way crazier feats. They regularly bounce back attacks with the bros hammer that are far stronger and faster than anything Sephiroth can put out, especially from their confrontation with Dream Bowser, who had 5th dimensional attack potency. The Mario Brothers can even destroy Sephiroth's soul after killing his body, which makes this a very clean victory. Kishimoto doesn't know how to beat Madara. This is in reference to a rumor that Kishimoto, the author of the Naruto manga, supposedly stated that Madara Uchiha had to be removed from the story and replaced with the villain Kaguya because he could not figure out how to possibly defeat him. 
This is not true, uh, but due to the pervasiveness of this rumor, a lot of Naruto power scalers believe that this makes Madara omnipotent, or incorrectly scale him as stronger than Kaguya, stronger than end of series Naruto and Sasuke, and just about every other character. This is a pretty common thing in these sorts of debates where people will reference different word of God statements that were never actually made in the first place, they're just rumors, so always be sure to ask for a source or a scan. Tirzu. This is a YouTuber who's made it his goal to get more people interested in zoology, or the study of animals, by power scaling them. He uses video gaming terminology in a comedic fashion, referring to continents as servers, and different species as builds, but at the core of his content, he does meticulous, quality work outlining the size, speed, weight, strength, and special abilities of countless different animals, and has made several great tier lists, scaling different animals within a genus or in a biome. Tier 8 This tier covers a lot of the heavy hitters, although there are more below, too. Extremely strong characters and universes that often come up in tertiary discussions. Cosmic Armor Superman also known as the Thought Robot, this is one of the most powerful versions of Superman across all canons, despite the fact that it's not actually Superman. Created by the Outerversal race of beings known as the Monitors, and described as being powered by the very concepts of symmetry, duality, probabilities, and possibility, Cosmic Armor Superman is literally a plot device. It takes the physical appearance of Superman, because it fulfills the role that Superman does in every narrative but on the grandest scale possible within the DC Comics. It can adapt instantaneously to any potential threat, manipulate reality, causality, and even the plot of the story itself. Kratos The main character of the God of War series, the Ghost of Sparta, is far more powerful than most people believe, primarily due to the lore surrounding his in-game feats. When he manages to unlock the power of hope, or the undying will to carry on, he gains the ability to manipulate concepts, an abstract existence that allows him to resurrect eternally even if he's killed, the power to negate the immortality of those he fights, as well as negate curses. He has low multiversal level attack potency, was able to battle on par with Thor and the Nidhogg, who could chew through the fabric of the multiverse. Lime Green this is an obscure meme, a reference to Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen. Gojo's primary cursed ability is Limitless, or the ability to manipulate the concept of infinity. He has the curse technique Blue, which allows him to essentially create a black hole, forcing matter closer together. His reverse curse technique Red does the opposite, repelling all matter in a burst of energy. And when he performs both simultaneously, essentially combining the power of positive and negative infinity, you get hollow purple, harnessing the power of the imaginary number to create an infinity that does not exist in this reality. It deletes from existence anything it touches in a gigantic torrent. Lime Green is the fan-made concept of Gojo creating yet another extremely powerful attack that surpasses the others, following the naming convention of a color. Uh, Lime Green was picked because of how weirdly specific and funny it is. I should note that part of this meme developed from a quote from the author of JJK, who said, Gojo succeeds at anything he tries. Of course, people have interpreted this to mean he could literally beat anyone ever, um, and of course they're wrong. Zeno Goku. This is one alternate universe version of Son Goku from the Super Dragon Ball Heroes promotional anime and manga series. It's important to note that this is a different version from the Goku people usually discuss. This version lived through all the events of the non-canon movies, as well as the timeline of Dragon Ball GT. So Zeno Goku can transform into Super Saiyan 4, but not any of the god forms or Ultra Instinct. He also has a slew of feats from the Super Dragon Ball Heroes manga and anime, where he acts as a time patroller, battling villains that threaten a multitude of different causalities. Due to the absurdity of his feats and the feats of his enemies, Xeno Goku scales up to 6th dimensional, or complex multiversal. He's currently much stronger than canon Goku. Post-Hawk, ergo Prompter-Hawk. 
sometimes just called the post hoc fallacy. This is when someone assumes two events happening in sequence have a causal relationship. For example, Spider-Man's costume was ripped when he fought against Green Goblin in this particular issue. Spider-Man won this fight, therefore we know that his costume being ripped is what gave him the strength to do it. This obviously ignores the multitude of other reasons Spider-Man could have won the fight, and while it may seem silly, a lot of people use this fallacy. Multiversal Doom Slayer The Doom Slayer, also known as Doom Guy, is the main character of the Doom series of video games. Put simply, he hates demons and he loves killing them, using a vast array of different, increasingly bigger guns. What's so interesting about him is that if you read the lore associated with the games, it becomes evident that he's not just some building level super soldier type character. He slays Khan Makir, the supreme being of the six dimensional space known as Erdak. And while fighting against the forces of hell, which is a higher dimensional plane than Erdak, Doom Guy actually implodes the multiverse, containing an infinite variability of branching timelines. Hell is not bound by time, space, or even dimensions. It is only bound by the concept of chaos, and its dark lord Davoth uh, is the source of all of Hell's power. And yeah, Doom Guy killed him too, destroying his very essence. Superboy Prime. This is an alternate universe version of Superman, who lost his home planet in the Crisis on Infinite Earths storyline. Slowly driven mad by this, he eventually cracked and went on a tear across the multiverse, trying to destroy everything and bring back his own version of Earth. What's so special about Superboy Prime is that he is significantly stronger than post-Crisis Superman, as well as most other Kryptonians. He's immune to kryptonite and magic, he's immune to reality warping hacks too. He casually tortured Mr. Mixie Spitalik and was unaffected by Dr. Manhattan. His presence alone strikes fear into the heart of Green Lantern rings. Not Green Lanterns, but the rings themselves. His punches not only shatter dimensions, but rewrite realities. His punches literally create retcons. He shattered the Anti-Monitor in a single strike, making him 6th dimensional on a very low lowball. Metahuman Ash So we know how powerful Ash's Pikachu is, but what about Ash Ketchum himself? Believe it or not, due to some of the shenanigans that take place in the anime, 10 year old Ash is actually a very powerful superhuman. He has relativistic reaction speeds, shown while dodging light-based attacks from Pokemon. He's fast enough to run straight up a wall, strong enough to casually lift a Cosmoem, which weighs over 2,000 pounds. He's jumped hundreds of feet in the air and even tanked island-level attacks. All that, and it still took him 20 years to finally become a Pokemon master. He should have just started throwing hands with the Pokemon himself. Tier 9. We're too deep now. It's your last chance to turn back. The Scarlet King. The SCP Foundation has thousands of entries, but perhaps the most important entry is SCP-001. And that's because we don't actually know what 001 is. There are 10 proposed possible contenders for the spot, with the other 9 being deliberate misinformation, created in order to prevent the real one from being discovered. One of these proposals is known as the Scarlet King, an ancient evil god of chaos that consumed all the other elder gods and has been attempting to enter our reality to lay waste to it. The king's mere presence in our world would tear apart the fabric of reality and spell an end to the universe and all adjacent causalities. He has an outerversal existence and immortality, space-time and conceptual manipulation, and he possesses an a-causal form, meaning if you manage to destroy him in the present, it will not affect him in the future, and he can simply return. He even destroyed the World Tree, an infinite library filled with platonic concepts. Dark Schneider A dark wizard from the battle sign in Bastard, Dark Schneider is infamous among power scalers for his ridiculous amount of specific hacks, abilities, and resistances. I'm going to give you an abridged list for the sake of brevity, but know that he has a lot more than this. 
It is a collection of barriers known as Dispel Bounds, each of which is designed to repel a different type of attack. There's a dispel bound for magic, reality warping, psychic attacks, physical attacks, herbicide, insecticide, gas attacks, sound waves, anti-assimilation, immortality erasure, there's a lie detector, anti-paralysis, anti-poison, anti-camouflage, even penicillin, whatever the hell that means. And every single barrier can repel up to 67 billion attacks every second. And if you somehow manage to break through every barrier, you need to destroy Dark Schneider on three separate planes of existence, or he'll immediately regenerate. He even wears a set of armor connected to every single dimension, so higher dimensional beings need to contend with that before attempting to attack him. Reality Equalization this is an important concept to grasp when discussing interverse battles where one character hails from a lower version of reality. I don't mean a lower dimension, but a lower form of reality. So for example, Sword Art Online or Tron, they both take place in virtual worlds, so the characters would technically immediately lose against any character from a physical world. Reality equalization is where we say, okay, if this character from Sword Art Online is going to fight this character from Black Clover, we're assuming they both have a physical existence for the sake of this hypothetical battle. DC Humans Double Stats So in the Marvel Universe, superheroes are always running around real cities like New York, Chicago, LA, etc. But in the DC Universe, all the cities are fictional. Gotham, Metropolis, West City, Star City. But what most people don't know is that all the real cities also exist. New York City is just north of Metropolis. Coast City is just south of San Francisco. So if all these cities exist, the actual Earth must be larger than Earth in real life, right? Otherwise, how would you fit twice the amount of cities? And that's where the scale comes in. The theory is, all human characters on DC's Earth actually have twice the strength and speed of a normal human, because the gravity is double. They look normal on their home Earth, but if you took Batman and placed him on Marvel's Earth, he would be a genuine superhuman. Popeye The cartoon sailor from the early 20th century comics and cartoons, Popeye is famous for his spinach gimmick, where he gulps down a can of spinach and through the power of Toon Force grows impossibly strong. But he does more than lift heavy things. Popeye actually has some bonkers feats. He can send his punches through radio waves, punch hard enough to alter the weather, use his bicep like a crystal ball and gaze into the future. He can manipulate his own age, survive in space without air or an atmosphere, shapeshift into a rocket ship, transmute a lion into a basketball, and even survived reality being deleted. And he doesn't even have access to a can of spinach because he can summon one from thin air with a whistle or petition Spinachia, goddess of spinach. And no, I didn't just make that last one up. That's real. Nine Inch Skulls. Several years ago, there was a post on the Who Would Win subreddit asking if Batman could defeat a silverback gorilla in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The outcome of that particular debate isn't important. What is important is that one of the commenters tried to argue that the gorilla could not suffer concussive damage to the head because its skull was, quote, nine inches thick. Now, in actuality, a silverback gorilla's skull is about nine inches long, which is probably where the commenter got confused. Uh, but to put that into perspective, if the bone of a gorilla's skull were nine inches thick, not only would their head be three times as big, but they could stop sniper bullets with their foreheads. Nine inches of solid bone is such a ridiculous and implausible assumption to make that it became a meme and people would often reference it. Like, well, uh, maybe Ichigo loses to Naruto, but what if Ichigo had a nine inch skull? What then? Tier 10. This, this is, is the, the bottom. bottom. There's, There's no, no escaping, escaping now. now. Embrace, Embrace it. it. Argument from Narrative 
This is a fallacy where one argues not using the feats or scaling for a character, but instead by analyzing the role they play in a story and transposing that onto the hypothetical narrative of a debate. I think the best example I can give is the two death battles between Goku and Superman. The conclusion they reached was that Superman wins, not necessarily because he has feats that are greater than Goku's, but because in Superman's stories, he's always as strong as he needs to be to win. So in this scenario where he fights Goku, he's as strong as he needs to be to win. It's important to understand that this is a fallacy, and if you were to take this seriously, then any protagonist would automatically beat any other character you put them up against, because protagonists have a nagging tendency to win their battles. Of course, Gon Freaks defeats Vegeta. In the story of Hunter x Hunter, Gon is a freak of nature who always pulls out a victory. See, it's silly, and it's, it's wrong. Azathoth. The works of H.P. Lovecraft often delve into a pantheon of gods renowned for their cosmic horror, or the way their unfathomable existence strikes fear into the reader through inherent incomprehensibility. Most popular of these gods is Cthulhu, but the greatest of these gods is the demon sultan Azathoth. Ruling over time and space from a black throne in the center of chaos, this outerversal supreme deity is omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. His very form is not only a-causal, but a-conceptual. He cannot ever truly be perceived, and every time someone glimpses his nature, they see a completely different form. Sugg's Verse This refers to a collection of stories written by Lionel C. Suggs, built upon the initial idea of pushing the very boundaries of what fictional characters are capable of achieving. The quality of his writing is generally considered to be rather poor, but Suggs himself is an interesting individual, and he has a rather pervasive digital footprint across various different websites and forums, scaling different characters and explaining his own character's abilities. To give you a general idea of what to expect when reading Suggs' verse content, many characters are not only omnipotent, but have power equal to omnipotence multiplied by infinity. Now, you probably guessed, this is inherently nonsensical, it doesn't make any sense. But that's how Suggsverse characters function. They are literally different conceptual forms of logic used to describe their abilities. Spade logic and Suggs logic. When a character grows powerful enough, they stop operating in accordance with logical principles and ascend to the complex and confusing principles of one of these new forms of logic. And at the very peak of power that a character can attain, they tap into our final entry in this iceberg. Reality Fiction Transcendence Beyond infinite strength, beyond the outerverse, transcending causality, omnipotence, all forms of platonic concepts and logic, sitting at the very highest point in all of fiction, is the real world. Our real world. The one where you're watching a YouTube video right now. The greatest feat a fictional character could possibly achieve would be to affect us. Affect the real world. That is reality fiction transcendence. Of course, there's a simulated form of this. Deadpool or She-Hulk will leave their comic book story and actually go speak to the writers at Marvel Studios. But those events are still bound within the comic book or TV show where they happen. This is just breaking the fourth wall. True fiction transcendence, which we could call breaking the fifth wall, is if Deadpool were to actually step out of the screen and shake your hand. And until this happens, the throne at the absolute pinnacle of power scaling still remains unclaimed. Wow, that was a lot. Honestly, with how many different characters and worlds there are throughout all of fiction, I could probably make an entirely separate iceberg filled with more niche and interesting power scaling topics and concepts. But I think this one gives you a pretty damn good intro into the hobby. The last thing I want to say, which is sort of like my love letter to the communities that I've been browsing since I was in middle school, is this. Power scaling is a fun, harmless activity for nerds who like math and debate. 
As long as you're not toxic about it and you don't spend your time bothering people with hot takes they didn't ask for, power scaling is a great hobby. Just like writing fan fiction or shipping or making stan edits or whatever else, power scaling is a totally legitimate way to appreciate media that you like. And if someone tells you it's stupid or pointless or annoying, tell them they have no right to police how you choose to engage with your favorite stories.